Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, a podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. David DJ Webb, a.k.a at DJ underscore carnivore keto is an intelligence officer in the United States Air Force who uses a keto carnivore diet to fuel his performance and maintain his physique and mental health. He's also a father of two young children and a seasoned bodybuilder and power lifter. And he's currently at 175 pounds body weight, approximately. David has spoken openly about his past with body dysmorphia, eating disorders, binging, and finding a more sustainable relationship with food through Keto Carnivore. Thanks so much for joining the show, David. Oh, well, thank you, Scott, for having me. I've been looking forward to it for quite some time. Yeah, likewise. And I know recently you've been on um, some awesome podcasts, Fast Keto with Vanessa Spina, um, Ketogenic Girl, Mark Bell's podcast, which I loved, um, and Robert's podcast, Keto Savage, which is always awesome. But um, for folks who aren't completely familiar with with your story. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, your relationship with food over time just to start? Yeah, so um, it really started uh, back in like 2008. Um, I competed in a natural bodybuilding show. Um, Back then, um, I was doing the whole um, what a lot of people call like to call uh, bro dieting or Um, This typical bodybuilding diet, um, a lot of uh, broccoli, chicken, protein shakes, uh, making sure I, you know, had carbs and uh, lean protein right after my workout during that anabolic window. And um, I was super strict um, with that uh, during the whole contest prep and whatever, Um, you know, from the point like I packed my meals wherever I went Um, I always turned down going out to restaurants with friends Um, and if I did I I brought my own food Um, sometimes you know it was just tuna and and some sort of veggies or whatnot Um, after that show um, that's where my eating habits uh, I really struggled with it I I started doing a whole thing where I was strict eating um, you know, five days a week. And then on the weekend, uh, me and my training partner, we would plan a cheat day. And during that cheat day, we, I mean, we would just eat as much as we could, um, whatever food it was. Um, And then uh, we'd feel sick um, the next day. And then by Wednesday, we're like planning the next weekend. Um, So that's where the binging started. and then I didn't really look at it as a problem, um, but I know that that's where that whole, whole um, aspect of you know my eating um, issues began. Uh, fast forward um, over the next few few years, um, I continue to do that. You know, some days it um, it went from you know not just on a Saturday, but then spilled over to a Sunday. Um, and, uh, and then I just found like every time I would like break my strict diet, like during the week, um, even if it was just for like one meal, um, I wouldn't stop at just one, enjoying one meal, um, away from my diet. Um, it turned into a whole day thing. Um, each and every time, uh, you know, I chose to, you know, give in or whatever, um, and so during that whole time, I really started to look at food as either good or bad from like a mental aspect. And so I, when I was doing that and looking at food, I, 
um, it changed to, you know, am I going to eat good today or am I going to eat bad today? It was never, you know, go enjoy a meal with, you know, my friends, get back on my diet. It, it would turn into a whole day thing. Um, and then, you know, fast forward a little, a little longer, um, you know, one of the things I've, I've talked about is this moment where I was out with my buddies um, at a, at a get together and they had challenged, they knew how I like to eat and how much I could eat. So they challenged me to eat a, a bunch of cookies and it must've been like 30 some cookies or something. Um, anyway, so I did, I did it. I ate it. I felt, you know, horrible and sick. I, uh, went to work that night, um, with the same guys. Um, my best friend at the time was my boss. Uh, I was working at a bar as a bouncer um, and as a bar back and I told him I said hey man I'm I really feel like I'm gonna like throw up man I feel really sick and he's like well you feel like you're gonna throw up you know go to the bathroom so they had this bathroom that we would use um, up above the bar that was in this like church nursery um, because the bathrooms in the bar were (laughs) gross and, and nasty so I went up there and um, it was to the point where like I, you know, I had never like made myself throw up before, um, but I knew like I needed to like throw up. And so I put my fingers down my throat and like instantaneously, like I threw up. Um, and so uh, when that happened, you know, I found myself that I couldn't stop doing it. And I, until I, I wanted to make sure I, you know, felt better because I knew how to go back to work. So at that time, I probably threw up, you know, upwards of 20 times. Um, and I walked away from the bathroom back to work, um, looking and feeling uh, like I did that morning. Um, and I didn't feel sick anymore. You know, I, I, was, I felt lean again and everything. And that's where it... it really triggered the whole, I can binge, eat whatever food I want, and then just get rid of it. And so that's, and that was in 2012, I believe, where uh, the purging happened. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, thank you for sharing that, David. And I can't imagine what it felt like um, starting to do that and I'm sure it was a mix of like excitement and other emotions. What did you feel at the time? Yeah, it was a little bit of both. Um, and definitely shame as well um, was a huge aspect. But um, the more and more it happened, you know, the easier the easier it was. Um, but, you know, I have a problem with like I'm either all in or, or all out and being – OCD about certain things and so where that came into play like um, with this this whole issue of of binging and purging was I eventually started I would weigh myself in the morning um, if I decided to eat quote-unquote bad that day and binge um, I would go home um, and I would weigh myself again see how much I weighed after a binge And then I would continue to weigh myself after each purge. Um, And then it ended up being that I would do it in a garbage can and I would weigh the the garbage bag and make sure that like it all equaled out. Like I, and I would purge until I reached the same body weight that I, I was that morning. Yeah. Wow. And how do you think, like, what do you think was the original source of some of your body dysmorphia? Um, do you think bo- that was all from body mil- building or what do you think led to um, sort of your, your poor body image and you feeling like you needed to do this? Yeah, I think it was a, a little bit of, you know, the bodybuilding thing and then um, being made fun of by people that were close to me um, growing up. Um, they would call me fat and do I think I was fat? No. Um, I had, I also had people that told me that I wasn't and, uh, 
but those those negative um you know thoughts definitely started to um you know once people were saying that you know my my mind was definitely um filled with those thoughts about myself and uh you know throughout high school and and even afterwards and then um i got into lifting you know solely um you know not just because of sports and whatnot but solely because of the way i felt how i looked um was a, a a direct reflection of you know who i was and um i never sp- spoke positively about myself and so and i would compare myself to other people um so that's where the whole body dysmorphia issue uh you know s- started happening and then you know obviously once you cut down for a bodybuilding show and you're in the best shape of your life and um that was the first time I was as lean as I was. Um, after that, you know, obviously I know, you know, mentally it's not sustainable to, to stay at, you know, sub 3% body fat. Um, but you kind of like, as you go out of it, um, you kind of, for me, at least you, you almost wish that you could always be there. And if you're not, um, for me, at least, you know, that I really struggle with, you know, looking at myself and um, not, you know, being negative about like, you know, where I was weight wise and leanness wise um, when I wasn't as lean as I was for, you know, my bodybuilding show. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can, I can totally see how that would be exacerbated by, by bodybuilding and feeling this, this need for achievement. And then that, sort of going away and, and almost feeling like part of your identity as you aren't as contest lean, which clearly isn't sustainable for large periods of time. Um, do you think that poor body image and and these types of disorders are more prevalent than we probably think in males, but just more more hidden? Oh, definitely. You know, I, I think a lot of men struggle with it and, um, you know, aren't in a place or vulnerable enough to, you know, talk about it um, because we're supposed to be the alpha male, you know, macho. And um, and so I just don't think it's, it's talked about it as as much as, you know, it, it probably should, because um, I mean, at least for me, what I found is um, once I decided to open up about, you know, my issues in the past, uh, that's when the healing really started to uh, occur. Yeah. And who did you try to speak with about this or where did you go for help? Um, when, when you were, when you're in the midst of purging? Um, so I talked to, uh, you know, I come from a huge family of, um, nine kids, um, seven of which that I, I grew up in my household. Um, but, and then all my sis, my older sisters are married, and I chose to talk to uh, one of my brother-in-laws about it um, for the first time. And uh, once he said that, you know, if I didn't, I didn't stop, um, that I needed to like go get help from a doctor. I mean, um, personal opinion, I never felt that, you know, I'm like, if I go see like a psychologist or whatever, I'm like, they don't, they don't know who I am or. Um, what about, I mean, anything about me. So I was like, you know, they're not going to be able to help. And so deep down, I'm like, I can do this um, myself. Um, But besides, you know, my brother-in-law, you know, I opened up to maybe, you know, one or two other people, but um, that was pretty much it. Yeah. And, and why do you think you've spoken about purging as, as almost looking for a freebie or a shortcut in nutrition. I think we all do that in some ways. That's probably why, you know, admittedly, that's probably part of why I started the carnivore diet, you know, this eat as much as you want and get fit kind of mentality. Do you think you're still doing this to some extent with some of your eating habits? Uh, For sure. I mean, definitely with purging, you know, my whole um, mindset about it was, I can eat whatever I want and, you know, stay as lean as I want um, and not worry about, I mean, obviously I wasn't worrying about the the negative side effects of it. Um, 
within my body and, and, and whatnot. So, um, you know, definitely, I mean, I've, I've tried so many different diets out there. Um, and eventually, you know, once I you know decided to, to do keto and, uh, yeah, that was definitely brought up where, you know, you can eat, you know, what you want. And, um, as long as you follow you know, the guidelines of the ketogenic diet or, and eventually which turned to the carnivore, more of a carnivore approach, then, um, and still reach those goals. You know, I think that was definitely, um, a factor in it. Yeah. And, um, how did, how did it change your relationship with your family? as well. You mentioned, you know, not going directly to some family members, starting to talk to some others. How did this, how did this affect that? So unless my family has really paid attention to, you know, some of the stuff I've um, put on social media or listened to the podcast, um, I don't think many of them know um, how serious it was. Um, I, I meant more like your wife, your your direct oh. family too. Yeah, so I was actually just talking to my wife about it today. Uh, um, I had asked her if she had listened to any of the podcasts I had been on. And she's like, no. Um, I tried, but I, I couldn't figure it out. And um, and I asked her, you know, what do you think I'm talking about on these podcasts? And she's like, well, um, your issues with eating and, and binging and and stuff and I was like well yeah that's definitely part of it but um I don't really think you know like how dark it was and 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 everything that went on um so after that conversation I you know I still don't think that um even uh, my wife you know truly um understands uh what I was going through at my darkest of times yeah that's really tough. And and what would you say, David, to someone who's going through this now, who's who's struggling with some of the same issues you did, um, and doesn't know doesn't know what to do, um, maybe doesn't even see a problem with it. Yeah. So you know, I, after um, the first couple of podcasts, you know, I've had, I've had a lot of people reach out to me, um, telling them that you know they've been going through the same thing, and. Uh, you know, first thing I, I say is, um, you know, well, this is the first step is 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 letting someone know, you know, what you're going through. And, um, you know, a few of them, you know, I was the first person they told. Um, and I can definitely uh, for me, um, it was a huge release just opening up about it and um, being vulnerable about it. Um, and when I chose to do so, like, obviously your worry is that people are going to think, oh, you just want people to feel sorry for you. And that wasn't it as all, um, wasn't it at all. Um, for me, um, you know, opening up about it, it just released like everything that, um, that weight of, of just keeping it to myself and, um, I mean, it was just a huge burden that, you know, was let go that I, I just opened up about it. So that's the first thing that, you know, um, I tell people is just, you know, find someone you trust that's not going to judge you for, you know, the mistakes you've made um, and open about what you're struggling with. And uh, I just think that, you know, is the first, you know, start to, um, you know, beginning that, that healing journey. Yeah. That's that's huge. And can you talk about how keto and carnivore came into the picture and, you know, where it helped or where it may not have solved all your problems? Yeah. So um, I used to be stationed up at, uh, at Travis Air Force Base in California. And at the time I was training at Super Training Gym with uh, with Mark and um, Chris uh, Bell would you know come up there every once in a while from L.A., and uh, Mark had started the keto diet um, and uh, was losing weight and stuff. Um, but I first started uh, talking to Chris about um, the ketogenic diet. And he's like, hey, you know, this is the, the book to go, you know, read or, or listen to. And um, I went and got it. I think it was Keto Clarity and um, I listened to the audiobook in like a day. 
Um, and he's like, why do you want to do the keto diet? He's like, you're already pretty lean. And I'm like, I just want to, you know, try something new. I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, but it was a new diet and I have been trying new diets for the past 10 years and I wanted to try something new. Um, shortly after that, you know, I, I bought all the keto, you know, supplements and, um, desserts and snacks and everything. Um, and after a few weeks, you know, I realized that like, I wasn't craving any, any of even the keto desserts. I wasn't, I would see donuts and people would bring pizza to work and I would look at that, look at it. And I like, I was like, I don't even want that. And I, I wasn't craving it. So, um, and obviously like reduced inflammation, um, and you know, less bloatness and, you know, my shoulder who I, I had issues with, um, started feeling a lot better because of the reduced inflammation. And so that's where, um, I was like, you know, I, rec I can really do this. Um, and as long as I, you know, stick to it, you know, I, I'm not worried about like falling into, um, a binge because I'm not eating any of those trigger foods, um, that would, you know, trigger me to, to binge and whatnot. Um, but I mean, while I've been doing, I've been doing the ketogenic diet, you know, for, uh, almost three years, um, carnivore more, uh, more of a carnivore approach since the beginning of this year. Have I still had some issues? Yes. Um, am I confident that like, you know, if I decide to, you know, enjoy myself, if I, you know, I'm traveling or, you know, go to a New York and have a slice of pizza, am I gonna, is it gonna send me into a binge? I don't know. I know um, I'm not confident that that, that would, would not happen. Um, but I mean, I am extremely, you know, satiated when I eat a, a good steak and, um, there's nothing, I mean, left for me to like really go and, and binge on while, you know, doing, uh, the carnivore, um, or keto diet. Yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate David, how you, how you talk about, you know, it's a journey you're on and it's not over and the keto and carnivore diet weren't magic bullet solutions for it. But it sounds like you have a much better relationship and awareness of food overall. Um, would you agree with that? Oh, for sure. That's great. And, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, no, nobody's perfect. Um, <clears throat> not making like a value judgment at all about about what you do or, or how you eat. But I think, you know, everyone is trying to improve their nutrition in some way or another. And I think, you know, one thing I always try to push away from or not do is is try to create any air of like superiority about one diet or over another, you know, carnivore over keto or, you know, if you include certain things in your diet, you're you're not as uh, not as elite. Um, you know, I, I think Sean Baker put it really well once saying like, there's no JV team on the carnivore diet. Uh, he said something like that in a video, which was, which I thought was actually pretty profound. Um, so I, I'm sure folks will be curious. Um, what, what do you eat in a day on, on your diet? What does your diet structure kind of look like? And what are some of the foods you enjoy and include? Yeah. So, um, Depending on if, you know, if I'm training in the morning or not, if I'm not training, uh, first thing in the morning, I'll have a coffee with some collagen, MCT oil in it, um, grass fed ghee or, you know, grass fed pasture raised butter. Um, and then that will be, you know, before I go to work <clears throat> and then, uh, I'll wait a few hours, um, and I don't like bringing steak to work cause I like to eat a steak fresh. And so, um, it typically it's either, you know, um, ground beef or ground bison or I love ground lamb. Um, so I'll, I'll, for the most part, bring like a pound of that to work. Um, and I'll eat that over sometimes one meal or sometimes two meals, um, depending on how I'm feeling. Um, and I always have things at work like, you know, the, um, F bomb pork sticks or, um, you know, the four five zero five meats, pork rinds, 
something like that just in case you know i, I get yeah. hungry um on on other days or some days that that i'll i'll fast in the morning if i if i train in the morning i'll fast and then won't eat until one of those meals um and then when i get home uh typically it's um either steak or i'll do like eggs and and some sort of meat um and then you know sometimes i have a keto brick or something but um as far as like organ meats and stuff um I I like the liverwurst and, and Braunschweiger from U.S. Wellness Meats. Nice. Um, yeah, it's, I mean that's how I got into um, you know started doing organ meats and stuff. But then I also have some uh, liver from you know a local farmer here, and then um, in my freezer you know I got cow tongue, I have beef heart. Um, but my family doesn't eat how I do, and so I. I if I'm if I'm making either one of those, you know, I'm gonna eat cow tongue for a few days, um, or beef heart for for a few days. Uh, so I just try to plan that out. Um, you know, what if I can, you know, bring it to work and and whatnot. But it's typically, you know, uh, any given day, it's uh, what I'll eat. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a pretty um, nutritious and also awesome approach. And given, you know, you don't have autoimmune conditions or anything like that, uh, you know, works to include some keto foods some things like uh, keto bricks, um, which are delicious and convenient. Um, so that's awesome. Definitely. Uh, and I've tried to just be intuitive about it. Um, like I said before, you know, about being OCD about stuff, I, I did the whole flexible dieting thing and um tracking my macros and stuff and i i would spend hours like trying to figure out exactly what i would, could eat in the day to hit my macros on the dot um and zero them out like um carbs fat and protein and so even with the carnivore or keto diet you know i'm not tracking anything uh right now and you know i don't foresee myself um unless i decide to do like a competition again or something but um i just try to you know eat intuitively you know some days it's higher fat some days it's higher protein depending on how i feel yeah i i'm and i've totally been there with the tracking neuroticism it's it's crazy um and i can imagine it it's extremely freeing for someone like you who had to be super diligent to get to um you know contest levels of of body fat, which, which you have. Um, and do you feel like working out fasted in the morning, you have any lack of energy or is, do you think that's suboptimal at all for, you know, muscle building or any of your goals? Uh, for me, no. Um, you know, first thing I, I do is I'll, I'll go for a walk or a run in the morning and, and I do not like running um, with anything in, in my stomach. Yeah. Um, and I just, I, I prefer, I've, I've had some of my best lifts while fasting, doing extended fasts and stuff, um, even before I started the ketogenic diet and I was just doing intermittent fasting. And so uh, um, I feel even better, you know, doing a you know, carnivore keto diet um, just based on, you know, having energy from um, ketones and whatnot. Um, but I don't feel, I'm, all, I'm pretty high energy anyways and so um you know for me i think i think for me it was more of a mental aspect getting over the fact that i needed to have like carbs or, or uh, food before i worked out um more than my body actually feeling like i needed it yeah totally i think a lot of people just just think they're going to go completely catabolic with no food in their system. And it, a lot of times it's just totally mental. Um, and you do some pretty, pretty like beast workouts as David, you know, you've, you've lifted a lot of weight as, as a power lifter and your bodybuilding workouts are definitely like not the average person's workout. Can you describe what some of your workouts look like and, um, you know, how you program, how you think about those things and, also, how much running do you do a week now? It seems like every day it's increasing. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I was doing um, like five miles a day every morning. Wow. Um, and even when I was powerlifting, when I was training at Super Training Gym, I, 
unless I was in an actual powerlifting contest prep, I would promise the guys there um, that were doing my programming that I would slow down the running. Um, but on any given day, I, even if we were squatting on a Saturday, I would I would go run in the morning just because I felt like it got my legs warmed up and it took me a lot less time to warm up when I got to the gym. Um, but uh, before I hurt my hand, uh, just over a month ago, I had been doing the um, keto muscle intelligence program uh, for about six weeks. Um, and that's with uh, Danny Vega and Ben Pakulski. And uh, with that programming, uh, you know, I, I did the whole bodybuilding um, thing where I would, um, you know, do your typical bodybuilding workout split, uh, one body part a day or, um, you know, a large, a large body pa- uh, part like chest and then do triceps or something. Uh, and I went through a phase where I, you know, I was powerlifting for a couple of years. Um, and so you focus on the main lifts, squat, bench and deadlift. Uh, plus some accessory work. Um, and the Keto Muscle Intelligence Program was really unique for me um, just because you still had some of those, um, you focus on those main lifts like squats, bench, and deadlift. Um, but it's also incorporating, you know, some of the bodybuilding stuff as well. Um, and you do a little upper body and lower body uh, during each um, given workout. And then um, the volume and number of sets and, um, you know, rest time varies um, from workout to workout and then uh, week to week. Yeah, I really like um, the Keto Muscle Intelligence program as well. Uh, Danny Vega was kind enough to send that to me. And, yeah, it's, it's really expertly programmed and some great stuff for our hypertrophy. Um, and David, I, I really appreciate you coming on today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, um, both about your past, which I think will be super valuable for people as well as what you're kind of doing now and, and how you fit it in with your very busy lifestyle as a father and, and being in, in the air force. Um, where can people find out more about you if they want to follow your content, what you're doing, things like that? So primarily on Instagram and uh, my Instagram handle is DJ underscore carnivore keto. And uh, that's where you can find me. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show, David. Thanks, Scott, for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered? Or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CarnivoreCast or go to CarnivoreCast.com. You can also email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.